Hello everyone. I'm here to talk about master copying and site size today. So for concept art, we're going to be doing lots and lots of master copies, one a, a week. And <clears throat> there's a couple of techniques that you should know about before you go into this. Uh, and also why we do this. So master copying is something that goes back a long time. Uh, Vasari wrote about it in the 16th century regarding all the Italian masters and how artists should do it. Uh, Charles Barg in the 19th century really codified this into uh, something that every student should know and how to do it. You can find this book online for free at archive.org. <clears throat> and it ended up being a really good system of just having accurate placement followed by accurate uh, values and how to go about this in uh, the way that's going to save you the most time and create the best results. Uh, the reason we do master copies is number one, it'll train you for accuracy of placement and color faster than anything else. And additionally, uh, I think it's good because you kind of learn about some of your history. Like, who are these people that, uh, you know, 200, 300, 500 years later, their paintings still resonate? So, to start this site size copy, I have the document open here. And I'm just going to change the canvas size so that it's the same over here where I'm going to work as it is over here. I got a canvas size. I'm going to switch the width to pixels. I'm going to do some quick math on a calculator over here to find out that uh, 796 times 2 is 1592. probably be smarter to do as a percentile. Oh, I'm going to do one thing first. Before I do that, I'm going to double click on the background layer and that'll just turn it into a regular style layer. So again, image, image size, rock. And 1592. Now I have an exact same size document over here as over here. So that's sort of the first step, is making sure that your proportions are the same. I'm going to lock this first layer so that we can't modify it. And we have that right on top. And we're going to paint on this layer below here. Now some of the rules that we want to follow here are we want to avoid color picking. So I don't want to just click off of this blue and paint it over here. We want to train our eyes to accurately see this stuff. And if you're color picking, you're not going to do that. So I'm going to start with just a neutral gray background. Alt plus backspace to fill that with my foreground color. And <clears throat> what I do a lot is create new layers with Control Shift N and merge them down with Control E. And I'm not going to mess with uh, too many masks or layer mode transfers and I just always want to think of this as new layers being like cut and pasted paper right on top and so my first thought is I want to get just a simple line drawing of placement now plumb lines are the first thing that we can use which are nice and easy and a plumb line is <coughs> uh, the idea that if we had a line going straight up and down we would be able to judge pretty easily whether something should be to the left or right of that. Uh, <clears throat> I think if we wanted to cheat, we could uh, set up a grid, which is another way of working on this. But I usually don't want to do that because, again, I want to train my eye better. So you can go new glide layout, and we could just have four rows, four columns. Four gutters, and then we would have that old school design challenge of just filling in each of these squares to match the other square. I don't want to do that. Uh, however, I do want to. It's nice to know at the very least divisions of the middles. So what I can do is just. four for here, no gutter, and two, and 
and no gutter. And I'm going to use this just as a starting point for placing this tower, because that's going to be my actual plumb line. You'll also want to actually not use snapping at all on this. So I know that this tower starts not quite at the halfway point, and therefore I do that right there. And let's clear our guides. That's all I'm going to use them for ever. So plumb lines are something that is very handy in that when I look at this stuff, I can just ask myself, where does this mark happen over here? I'm also going to use horizontal plumb lines. And horizontal plumb lines are the idea that if this tower, this sort of bulge starts right here over here, it's going to be the same on the x-axis over here. But I'm not going to use a guide because I want to try and train my eye as often as possible. So. What I'm thinking about when I work is where these are, as sort of basic level things. I look also a lot at where things intersect the picture plane. So this intersection happens right there. And try and draw with straight lines as possible as often as possible. Again, here, the plumb line for the top of this thing is right about there. <coughs> There's a couple of uh, problems in Photoshop that you can run into if you're thinking about this in the wrong way. And I think one example is uh, what brush should you use? I don't care. You should just see this as something that doesn't matter at all. I tend to use these Craig Mullins oil pastels a lot, but it doesn't matter. Spacebar to move this stuff. And a lot of times, the only thing I change is my opacity and flow. I like doing a flow of around 40, which is going to be a little less flowy than this. And then as I work, if I need it to be softer and more gentle, I will make it more gentle. So here looking at this intersection right here. I know it's kind of on this x-axis. And if this plumb line that we had for this building all the way down would be right around here, this part of the tower would be slightly to the side of it. As I work, these layers are going to get increasingly destroyed. And I want you to keep that in mind when you're working, because I don't want you using the undo brush, or the undo button. That's the other thing, is we don't care about what brush we're using, and we don't care about undo. How would this work if it was actual paint? Uh, usually what would happen is you would just paint on top of whatever you painted before. So the way that you would fix your mistakes is not by uh, not by um, adjusting how things work. Um, what am I trying to say? You wouldn't fix them by uh, adjusting layer mode transfers or undoing it. You would just drop more paint on top of what you already painted. See this little extra corner of the shadow? It kind of aligns right here with this. So I'm going to keep that in mind as I place this. And then I should be able to gauge this distance of the shadow and just put that in. That's good enough. I'm going to create a new layer. I create new layers all the time. And I am going to try and eyeball guess this color. Now for the first few weeks, I want you guys actually using uh, grayscale. So if I unlocked this and did a hue sat, removed all the saturation, I want you guys copying something like this to start with because this simplifies the problem. Uh, but for this case, I'm going to actually use color because that's what later on we're going to be copying. So my first pass on this is trying to match the values of this. 
And I'm trying to make this swatch look like the same value as this over here. Now if I can find this in the hue, or in the value right here, it's around there. There's only two other vectors that we have to consider, which are the hue, this is a little too purple, and the saturation. And right around there, a little more teal, right around there is a good starting point. But I'm going to work iteratively, so it's okay if I don't have it perfect right now. Let's go back to that. Nice pastel. Oh no, I covered up my line drawing, guys. What am I going to do? Uh, Again, talking about things that I think Photoshop users oftentimes do wrong is you can get so uptight about having your layer orders right and having selections right. And you forget that this picture plane is really an opaque problem that we're going to work on. And it doesn't need that level of sophistication. So this over here, again, I don't want to color pick it because I want to train my eye. <coughs> It's kind of, I want to say, uh, if I look over here, I can see it even more. I want to say it's kind of like that brown. And don't worry if you get it wrong, because we're just kind of constantly approximate. It's pretty close. And that orange is kind of right there. Oh no, I painted over the camel. What's going to happen? If only there was a way to paint on top of paint. Now you can color pick off of your own palette. Because I think that is sort of uh, somewhere that you've already worked. And I think you did the hard work of trying to figure out these colors. Uh, I have my eye all the time over here on uh, the thumbnail, uh, the navigator, where I can see a lot of this stuff very close up or very far away. And it's the equivalent of like viewing your painting from across the room. It just ends up having a massively beneficial effect. I actually think it's really good for you to have this sense of uh, not focusing on borders and layers used only for one thing. Because a lot of times, in painting, for one thing, usually you don't. You have to just control your edges on the fly. And you work general to specific because that's the way that you get it done fastest. I'm not even looking at what I'm painting. I'm looking over here, by the way. Uh, but also there is an artistic quality known as sfumato, or smoke-like transition. And it's the idea that these individual objects, the camel versus the building, versus the other building, versus the tower, versus the shadow, they don't necessarily have to be thought of as separate ideas. You can just dive into them and <clears throat> um, their edges actually blend together a whole lot. And I'm using a gentle touch. I'm going to lower my, f I have enough down now that I think I'm going to lower my flow to 10. Usually it's the number keys, which change your opacity. And the flow is changed with shift number keys. So if I say shift 3, it'll change my flow to 30%. Shift 10 will change it to 10%. And if you do it really fast, it'll do a tens digit followed by the ones digit. So I could type in shift O1 and get 1% flow, which has its own benefit because you can just slowly build it up very, very slowly, very gentle. I'm going to 
I'm trying to get some camel in here. I want to flow over on 10. A lot of times I'll do something like I'll set my flow to 10% and I'll use something that's technically too dark and then I'll just immediately color pick myself back into what I actually want. So this needs to be a little darker. And again, now you can see a certain start to what I'm hoping here, which is you don't have to worry about, oh no, I went too high there. What you do is you just color pick next to it and you adjust. I'm going to try and get something that's a little more right there. The other benefit, there's a couple of benefits to this sort of mentality. Number one, uh, what I like about it is that I used to do a lot of, you know, just right before bed, I would do a little bit of painting on my Microsoft Surface. And I still have a tablet. Uh, now I have a Lenovo Yoga, and I do the same thing. And it's just nice to start a painting, start falling asleep, and then you have little dreams about this. I can tell over here, by the way, that this is not the right color. It's a little too light in value, and it's a little too... Uh, I think it's not saturated enough, and I think it's a little more green. Again, I do a slight brush stroke, and that's going to mix a little bit of this with that. I look over here. Versus over here. Uh, so when I was on this, uh, on you know, painting with the surface a lot, what I would run into is you can't afford a ton of layers and a ton of selections because your computer will crap out. And also, you can't afford a ton of undo history. In fact, let's up the ante real quick. And under history log, not history log, I think it's under scratch disks. I'm going to change my undo steps to only be That's it. I'm going to change my history state to actually only be 5. 5 undos is all I'm allowing myself. <clears throat> so, as I get closer and closer to this, uh, I can always just go in and after the fact, focus on my hard edges. So now, about this time, I want to start having a sense of where these are. And another thing that I think a lot of early Photoshop users don't do right when they're painting is they focus too much on soft brushes. Like they're so used to markers and paint splatters and things that go on really hard and never come off. And the idea that you could have ooh, what is it, this soft round, it's so exciting to them. And it makes art that is a little soft and underwhelming. So what I prefer is I always have my opacity at 100%. I reduce my flow when I need soft transitions and I try and actually adjust my 
uh, brushwork. I actually try and just have a gentler hand when I work on this. <clears throat> Is that too dark? Is that too light? Is it too saturated? Is it the wrong hue? When you break it down to these three or four questions, suddenly it's not so scary. I try to jump around a lot. Again, I'm trying not to be too concerned with details at this point. I'm looking over here when I paint a lot. I think I'm about to add something that's slightly higher in value. So I'm using this plumb line of where this edge right here comes down. And notice that, I mean, I can show you with a ruler, but this is where I start judging my accuracy of placement. So if I pull this over, you can see that this edge of the building down here is slightly past this edge here. So if I have that same sensibility here, I'm going to make sure that my building is slightly adjusted to compensate for that. I'm not saying that layers and fancy brushes and layer mode transfers are bad. Uh, I, I think that um, it's something where people use them incorrectly a lot of times and uh, they rely on the program as a crutch and they never actually get good at painting which is what you're trying to do right so we will be using lots and lots of layer mode transfers lots of clipping masks all that stuff for a scalable pipeline but a lot of times when you do concept art like this and uh, at the big fancy places they hand it off to <coughs> the art director and they just do paint overs on whatever you worked on. And a lot of times they don't want to delve into your layer systems and your layer comps and clipping masks and all that. And so they just create a new layer and do paint overs directly on it. So I can tell that I need to start going up in values. And a lot of times this is pretty true to how I've worked in the past, which is your highest values are something that you kind of wait to punch up. Now, is that too bright? Not bright enough. <laughs> it's a little brighter right there. I'm trying to just think about where these accents go in with a lighter color right around there. So, yeah, if you have a total piece of crap computer. Uh, this setup, where I'm just like forcing it, and by the way, where's my line drawing? It's almost totally obscured now, right? It was only there to get us to the next stage, and all this color, you should think of this as a line drawing that is going to become destroyed at some point. <clears throat> I'm going to put right there. Now, I can see right here that this shadow is a little too dark compared to this one. And so I'm going to color pick off of that as a starting point, not off of the, re the reference photo, off of mine. I'm just going to change its hue a little bit and up its value a little bit and add some of that purple in. And a lot of times this ends up being something where it's only here for a little bit, but it will end up getting mud mixed. So maybe it's not the correct color. Maybe I'll add in a little bit of the sky color. But all of this stuff can get mud mixed a little bit into, on purpose, uh, the color that you want. So what I'm looking for is something akin to this color here. And maybe that blue and maybe that uh, purple it was way too much. But it kind of got me a little bit closer. So now I can color pick inside of this. I'm holding Alt 
or option, depending on your computer. Just get a little more of that at a time. And if I want a really hard edge, I will set it to 40% flow, which will mean a lot of this comes out. Again, at 100% flow, it comes out very hard. And it's funny because if you work in this loose flowing way, or this uh, method where you're using a little bit at a time, the result is that uh, if you color pick inside of this, that is so referential to the colors near it that when I paint in a hard edge here, it kind of blends right with its neighbor. So now I can get this hard edge here. And I'm just color picking over here, color picking over here. And because I did all this loose work, general to specific, it ends up not hurting things. I'm going to put a little bit of this purple color into the shadow here. You'll notice that a lot of times, along shadows especially, uh, you can see a little bit more. Uh, any sort of transition from light to dark tends to have a little bit of extra chroma or saturation. Like, why would I create a second layer for these people? It sounds like so much work. I hit D to go back to pure black. Now this guy, if I follow a plumb line, a lot of times, again, I think you learn the mentality of artists who came before you. Look at this guy down here by the building. It's almost perfectly aligned with this point of the roof here. I feel like when I see things like that in the art or in a master copy, <coughs> Uh, I can tell that Jean-Léon Jerome put that there on purpose. And it's just like a little Da Vinci code of what was his thought process to get over here. I'm fixing a lot of this guy. Uh, you can see that he was way off with this uh, black blob over here. He was actually way more over here. And again, have I used the eraser tool at all? No. Erasers are another thing that total jerks use because they suck. Never erase. Do you know how much work it is to clean up student eraser marks on tables after the end of the day? It's awful. And if a student is using an eraser in their art, chances are that means they're not good enough at art to clean up after their mess. So I end up cleaning it up. Whatever, I'm ranting now. I'll stop. I want this guy to be just a little bit lighter, so I'm going to switch my flow back to 10%. Just put a little bit of light here. And then I'll color pick off of that slightly lighter color. And so it blended, and that blend is now my new sort of reference. Hard edge, soft edge. A little bit more of that purple in here. Let's go back up to 100% flow. Uh, I like this method also because of, I think it fits with my personal style and also the artists I really enjoy. Uh, the golden age of American illustration had a lot of guys like uh, Mead Schaefer and Tom Lavelle and uh, Dean Cornwell. I encourage you to look these guys up. And they were part of a change in the artistic tastes and fashions of the day. Namely, they were making art to go along with print publications. And they had a bit more of a deadline oriented focus. And so a lot of these guys no longer worked with oil. They were working with gouache and perhaps a little bit of the newer acrylic. And sometimes they were still using oil, but they had to adjust their method to something that was a little more a la prima and uh, had some panache to it. And so they have this extremely brute force method of rendering that I just freaking love. 
So this needs to be a little darker. Is that edge? Let's see. Let's check our plumb line. It's about that far away. So if the plumb line is here, I think this sky needs to be a little more like this. And you can see how I just keep color picking and blending and color picking and blending. And because I'm so close to this, it doesn't matter that I'm going at 100% flow. Like This is as opaque a brush as you can get. Uh, when I need that hard edge, because I'm referencing the color right next to it, it doesn't end up causing this jarring, aggressive change. I'm trying to not paint with one color. So a lot of times I'm just color picking right before I brush something. I do it. <clears throat> I think you can see based on this that this distance is not far enough. Does that look a little better? Let's check our viewport or our navigator. It's a little better. A little bit at a time. I think uh, if you zoom out, let's take a quick moment to talk about this at the fuzzy JPEG level. What are the biggest problems that still exist here? I think some of the little dark highlights for the windows and people still need to go in. I think uh, the big problem, though, is there's more orange and brighter values on the side of these buildings. And then the camel's not in there yet. Now, a lot of times the way I work with this stuff is... I will continuously create new layers and sometimes jump back and forth between moving them. And what's also nice is that if you do miss your undo stack, don't hit undo over and over. What you should do is just create a new layer and that layer represents the next 15 or so brush strokes that you are going to do. And So let's say you're putting this camel in and you're worried that it's going to suck. Let's create a new layer. This is the camel where I'm going to add in some shadows to him. Capacity and my flow to 100%. And he needs some more red. Let me get a nice dark red. I'll test that. How does this look compared to over here? Is it the val is the value correct? Is it too bright or too dark? Is the saturation correct? I think it's a little too saturated. Let's try that. How about now? I think that's a little closer. Maybe it needs to be one step darker. And again, I could always just uh, do things like uh, color pick off of some black to get that if I needed. Now let's compare this camel's head on mine over here versus over here. I think my camel is way off. Now if I draw a plumb line you can see this, but try and envision it before we do that. Uh, the camel's nose here is where we're going to get this plumb line. And I'll go above here and draw a little guide here. So if I hold shift I can draw straight lines up and down. And you can see that the camel's nose is way, way off. <coughs> so maybe I'll select these former layers. I'll merge them all down. And I'm going to make a selection and just move this camel a little bit over. Right around there. I'm going to merge it down again. I'm going to merge down 
Uh, fuck it, let's just merge all the way down. So, I was using Control H to hide my selection, and then the Move tool. Oh no! What are you gonna do? I moved that stuff. Actually, here. I'm gonna move this with Alt, which will drag off a clone of it. And right around there is where that camel's supposed to be, I think. Right? We can also gauge stuff like. Uh, I'm gonna go back to this. So compare here to here. That's a canvas in itself, and we can use that to say that right here is the midpoint, right? So on that midpoint, if we drew something similar over here, from here to here, if this is our midpoint, we can see that I think this, uh, I think our dome is pretty correct in its placement. And our camel, meanwhile, needs to be a little more. Its head is about here. We got that pink color for its head. And it's fun because you can be very abstract. You can even take your glasses off. Really gauge it. <coughs> and my brush is too small. Because why? We want to work general to specific, big to small. So I'm using that line to gauge things like how the camel's leg needs to come over more. Again, notice how I don't erase. I just, you know, if it's either the leg or the background, and I put the leg in, why not just paint the background in next to it? We're going to get some of that blue color for the shadow. By the way, this is a way easier job than uh, this when you do this as a black and white study, which I want you guys doing for the first couple weeks. But with black and white studies, all you're doing is asking yourself, is this too light, is this too dark? Or preferably, uh, what step value is it? So just to show you what a step value is right now, let's create a little, little square here on a top layer. And I'm going to fill this with 100% black. I'm going to lock the pixels on it. And, oops. New layer. Fill it with black. Lock the pixels. And I'll move this over. And on this one, I'll fill it with 10% black. How do I do this? Oh, wait. I'm doing this the stupid way. Let's use the internet. So on the internet, uh, let's just Google value scale. Oh look, everything we need. And that's the one. This is the one. Black is zero. Just so you know. Now let's paste that in. And if you were doing this as a black and white image, So if I was doing it in this style, 
what I would have to do is I would just pick a point like over here and ask myself what value is it and it's probably around a four or a five and I would just paint with that over and over <clears throat> it's still kinda handy and I like uh, having one of these where you can actually just move it around and if you're working on this move this value scale back and forth until you choose oh this one is a three the shadow is quite dark what about over here three. So I need to get a little more orange. And I'm going to go back to my actual layers that I was working on. I'm going to merge that down. Because layers are for jerks. We only need one layer, right? One layer, one brush. Paint a little on that side. Get a little blue. Layers aren't for jerks. I gotta stop being so hyperbolic. I'm going to delete this plumb line. Both of these plumb lines, they've had their chance to shine. So I'm going to turn off these. Now again, you might be tempted to paint all these individual stripes on the building, but that doesn't follow our rules, which are general to specific, right? So before we paint those, we want to have the bigger idea of where these shadows are. And it's fun when you start looking at this and you can see like little areas where not quite that much, but some amount of red is getting reflected into there. Reduce that to 10% flow. is not light enough. What does it look like over here? Navigator's your friend. Another reason I like this setup is probably the most common thing you'll hear people scream and paint about with Photoshop or any sort of painting application is they're painting and they're painting having a good time and then they realize they painted on the wrong layer <clears throat> and then everything is ruined and if you stop feeling like you're beholden to a layer based system you're going to have a better time So when I want to soften this shadow, again, like as it goes up this, it has sort of a hard edge down here. I love that blue shadow that I like so much. Uh, Uh, so a lot of times what I'll do to soften this is I'll just color pick in between those two spots. And 
eyeball it like that. So similarly. Why not just soften it like that? I mean, you know, if you know me, you know that I rant a lot. <clears throat> and we get so uptight about scalability and making sure that you're non-destructive and smart objects and always do things in a non-destructive way. And then people's paintings look like shit. And, you know, how is it that 500 years ago people were making perfect masterpieces uh, that captured their environment, that captured an evocative aspect of the human spirit, and they didn't have tablets, they didn't have Photoshop, they didn't even have Photoshop 1.0. They were moving dirt and mud around with a stick. And I think that's one thing I really like about this setup is once you stop once you stop worrying about that stuff, you feel a lot more free to Where am I? What am I doing here? You can just enjoy this as a purely brush interface. Switch to hard rounds. The other thing I'll do occasionally is what's great about all this setup is uh, you can use the smudge brush and especially like on the sky here or in here where you don't want these textural ideas you can just get rid of them really fast. Mixer brush is also kind of fun. And that, as I work now, I can do something like get a little bit of red just for these sort of shadow areas. Sort of dark red area. Let's say I want a little bit of that in there. I need to be over a little more. I think so. Just a touch. Some of that warm color. <coughs> and sometimes around this point, if I'm more concerned about edge quality, I use the hard rounds.
especially when you're starting and like just one layer is locked and you don't understand what a locked layer does and you just get more and more frustrated a lot of times uh, you just like can't get to this point where you're starting to refine it and see more and more of the fine details emerge and start to see the painting emerge and you just gotta stick with it it's something like at some point it goes from crap to and you know nebulous stuff to like a really finished work and it's no longer impressionism oh no wonder somehow I set my mode to dissolve <laughs> kinda created a cool effect how long was that going on See again, you're always going to have that happen in Photoshop. It's just one thing switches. And then nothing seems to work. I kept, uh, you know, the oil pastel brush was uh, too textural. And so I changed to the soft round and it was still like pure texture. But it doesn't matter. Again, what's your first line of inquiry? Accurate placement. What's your second line of ac uh, inquiry? Accurate value. What's your third line of inquiry? Accurate hue and saturation. And only at your fifth line of inquiry do we say accurate edge quality. Although edge quality is nice. I think this is not red enough. So general to specific. Get more of that shadow in. When I think back on all the years I wasted doing like drop shadow and emboss to make a bubble effect, <coughs> when I could have just been doing this sort of brute force painterly stuff, it makes me feel a little sad. This is so much better. Such a better way to go. I think this is to be a mark over here. And I don't know, like I've evolved as an artist a lot, and uh, I remember like being a youngling and trying to get every single trick I could out of Photoshop into my brain. <coughs> and the older I got, the more I realized like you know, it's such a waste of time. And a lot of times, the result was like in no way painterly <coughs> painterly what a fun word I'm going to reduce my flow to around 15 and I mean it's funny because like 
the mixer brush and some of the and like the smudge tool <coughs> you can get that same effect just by color picking referentially getting over cold. One way to spend your spring break. Sick and red in canvas shells. So when I look at this shadow shape, I see this point here. And I'm using all the other plumb lining I've done so far to figure it out. So if I draw a plumb line across, I see that it's at the same X height or Y height as the camel's eyeball, kind of. So I'll go with that. You know, happy accidents. I kind of miss that extreme dissolve look. It's kind of fun. Anyway, I did it on purpose. Again, like the ridiculousness of <coughs> trying to keep all these. Dudes, it's like separate layers with a layer mode transfer and a separate mask for each of them. It seems like such a monumental waste of time. The older I get, I'm going to grab this guy really fast. And again, I'm going to switch to the move tool. And this is all pretty close in placement, but I think he needs to be a little further this way. So I'm going to hold Alt while I move this. No, Shift while I move this. No. Merge down. That's it. And then Alt. When I have this selection and it's all like one layer here, if I hold, if I move it, it'll just cut it out, right? But if I hold Alt while moving it, it will move on top of that. And a lot of times, it's so easy to just do that. Oh no, but what about this weird pixel line? How will I solve that? I go in and be a painter. So this guy's head is about there on the stone. And if I pull the plumb line from this roof down, he's slightly to the edge side of that. So now I have to adjust my thinking here on a couple of levels. Number one, yeah, that guy, this guy's head here is, so the guy is slightly below the rooftop, this backwards rooftop. But where is this rooftop in relation to everything else? So if I compare from here to here, I can see that this is where the middle is, so it should be slightly before the midpoint of those two things. So if here's the midpoint, I can see that the roof can be moved over a little bit. And that, <coughs> and then this guy can be moved over a little bit as well. So again, brute force. Just jam on those pixels. This guy's going to go a little further this way.
Again, <clears throat> the idea of having each one of these characters on a separate layer is so offensive to me that I think I could vomit. And, uh, if you want to see artists who exemplify that disgust, I would look at Dean Cornwell and Mead Schaefer. And they occasionally, uh, another one is J.C. Leyendecker, but although he has a little more finesse, but in this brute force mentality, all of these things merge into a shadow shape. So you don't need to think of it as individual guys. See if you can break this down in your vision to something that is just this. Create a new layer with control shift N, move it up with control bracket. Try and break it into this mass of black with occasional white dots and then refine it like that and then occasional white dots. <clears throat> That's a really simple shape and it's actually a fun example of uh, how we can think about this. If I were going to try and take this shape over here, you can see some of the places where I need to adjust my placement a little bit. It looks like I got the guy a little too high up, so I need to adjust that plumb line. Um, but what does this shape look like to you? If I copy that and create a new image that's just this shape, what do you see when you look at this? It's almost a Rorschach test, right? So if I simplify this, into this shape, that's really something that you could envision like cutting out of paper, right? And it's kind of like a, a weird T-bone maybe, or <coughs> uh, I don't know. This one's tough. Be like, uh, if I break it down even more like that. It starts looking like, I don't know, a really squashy thumbs up. And so if I think about that over here, make sure I'm not painting on a. So if I envision that over here, I'm going to make my crappy thumbs up and by simplifying it down into that shape it makes it a lot easier to see. So there's my arm and here's the little thumbs up. And again it was sort of a derpy hand that I was thinking about. And suddenly, our placement is a lot better. Not perfect, but it is better. So the excellent painter, um, <coughs> Cesar Santos, uh, talked about how he learned this at the Repin Academy, and he had an, a teacher point out that if you look at the curve of a, the shadow shape inside of an ear, because everyone struggles with painting ears, right? Uh, but if you just broke that down to look like kind of a, a giant bird head on a long spindly neck, suddenly it's a little easier to make that shape out. And after that, this complex form it's much easier. I'm just going to add a little bit of white here. I know it's too much. So I'm going to immediately color pick off of that blend to get the gray that I want. <coughs> so just by, so again, to show that again, this is way too light, right? 
but it's referential to the scene, and that's good. I'm going to put a little dot here. That's too much. But I can color pick off of that new mix of uh, the too much plus the black. I can further mix it with black until I get something that's kind of just where I need it. And this sort of method of uh, arising, arriving at the color combo that you care about tends to make really nice results. So this is too much, right? But I can color pick where it's blending. The other thing I like about this is that this strategy is <coughs> um, it's so low program that you can duplicate this real easy in other programs. So uh, if you use GIMP or Photoshop or Krita or Paint Tool Sci or Painter, this is how those programs work, in my opinion. Uh, and oftentimes. much better than Photoshop. So I'm just creating little, little outcroppings. I can take away that crazy hand. Let's delete those layers. Now at this stage, what would you say is the biggest discrepancy from the left and the right? I'd say the camel is sort of our foreground primary element, and that probably is where I would want to spend more detail. <coughs> I think the back building needs some of the shadows improved. And this tower is too high up, right? So I'm going to work on that first, because accurate placement is the first thing we want to get right. a little too high. If you look at it over here, a lot of times when it's reduced to 100 pixels, it becomes real obvious that this just needs a little more blue to chop it down. The other fun thing about this is like, although like the rules of perspective are really useful here, uh, you're sort of using empirical perspective. You're just brute force making sure that what it looks like over there looks like the same thing over here. Now I have to be careful color picking off of this over here because they are, uh, this building is a little further back and so it's going to have slightly less atmospheric perspective. Now here's a philosophical conundrum for you. 
if you did color pick over here, <coughs> would I have any ability to tell? I don't know. If you ran this through a series of filters, and you paint daubed it, and you stylized it, and then you used the mixed media brush, and, or the wet media brush with sample all layers, and you created a duplicate of this, um, would I know? I probably would know in that case. But would you know <coughs> that you did it? Yes, and I think the fundamental problem you're going to run into is that these are actually useful skills that you as an artist should care about uh, cultivating. And uh, if you go about cheating like that, yeah, that's great and all, but is it going to come back to haunt you someday when you're working on pro production and stuff and the only thing you know how to do in Photoshop is paint daubs a photo so that it looks like a painting and <coughs> add some drop shadow to it? Jean-Leon Jerome, by the way, was a painter who was sort of the king of the academic era of paintings. This was a society where uh, as countries got more and more wealth and uh, it was lots of colonial imperialist stuff going on. I won't get into the details, but it's certainly worthy of criticism. Uh, in some respects. Uh, but so all these countries of the colonial era were trying to outshine each other on who had the most majesty and dominance in culture and all these other aspects. And so the academy was one such place. Like It was considered uh, a sign of a great society that you had an art institution that was producing masterworks and in the academy, you had a sort of wassail standardization of how to paint. And John Leon Jerome and Charles Barg were a big part of that. Uh, they made the Charles Barg drawing course. And so John Leon Jerome, as part of France's colonial history, uh, went on a number of uh, expeditions to uh, their various colonies in Egypt and Africa and painted the splendor of the French exotic empire and you take those back to France and people would look at it and go, oh, oh so fancy. And so uh, he is part of uh, a movement in art known as Egyptomania where we got sort of obsessed with this exotic sort of Aladdin's lamp world from afar. <coughs> so he went on a number of expeditions doing these sort of little paintings. I think I just color picked off of that painting for the first time. So, so again, I, I didn't need a light blue. I just needed a lighter color. So this is pure white practically. I just put a dab there. And then I grabbed from the mixture to sort of blend out some of the sky. And I'm focusing too much on a detail, so I need to zoom out. Anyways, Charles Barg, not Charles Barg, Jean Leon Jerome was known as sort of a brutal taskmaster and very unfun guy. So I've read uh, 
the academy was very much kind of a good old good old boys uh, society and the thing that I've heard that I thought was kind of funny is like if you were the senior painter in the class you got a better spot for life drawing for where you got to sit to view the model and so the brash seniors would come in with a gigantic 10 foot canvas and plop it right in front so nobody could see anything Again, I just so prefer working at 100% opacity. It's so dangerous, and it seems like the opposite of what you should do when you're starting. But all you got to do is, you know, soft touch. And if it's too light or too dark, color pick something that's less light and dark. So again, I'm looking at these little shapes here, and I don't want to worry about the nooks and crannies of them, because I need to make sure that in relation to each other, they're accurate before I commit. So I'm looking at them as just big, swoopy shapes for now. Let's <coughs> see. This is not the only way to paint. You probably have seen plenty of tutorials on how to paint in the fashion that sort of appeals to you, how to paint video game concept art or something, how to paint naked anime ladies, kids these days with their anime. So if you have techniques beyond this, you know, it is an exercise in personal exploration to some extent, like, it's just a problem and how do you go around solving this problem, and no two people are going to solve it in the same way, which is kind of the fun of it. I hope that I can provide some ideas that are novel to you. probably the number one technique that is missing from this that I actually use a lot is lasso selecting for your paintings. So if this is my plumb line still coming down from here, this is the center of that plumb line and this little shadow for that bar is going to be right over there. A lot of these guys like Jean-Léon Jerome, uh, they, uh, they were considered real shit in the 20th century. Nobody liked them. Why, why would you want these guys? They represented imperialism, the most, uh, the most relevant recent, uh, worldwide events that they were associated with were basically the propaganda wing for World War One and Two. 
And in World War One and Two, we saw so much brutality and murder and unhappiness that you know the art really changed from there. And the idea of having some sort of hallowed institution for imperialist powers was considered kind of lame. Uh, Hitler was real into realist art, which was not good. He was bad at it. Um, in America, we sort of turned away from it because of uh, the Cold War, because the Russians doubled down on it too. Soviet realism was a big movement. And uh, the tragedy there is that um, there are hardcore physical skills that are really useful here. And we kind of have an artistic dark age of arts education where nobody was looking at good painters to learn how to paint good. And recently, with the dawn of special effects in cinemas and video games and the increased egalitarian openness of our ability to make those things. Uh, there's been a renewed interest in these guys as somebody who was, you know, people who were just very, very good at painting. And uh, it's funny because how do you separate the artist from their work? Can you? Sometimes we say yes, sometimes we say no. <clears throat> and I don't know. It's all very interesting, heady philosophy. Uh, I just want to paint. Uh, especially in the darks and the grays, a lot of times you're probably thinking I'm crazy right now. Uh, a lot of times in the darks and the grays, you can see uh, just a very, very slim hint of color. Like right here, you can see blues. Over here, you can see some amount of red. And there's something called vibrating color, which is the idea that if you put those colors in and then muddy them down until they're practically invisible, that's better than just going with the straight gray value that you were looking at. And so on something like this, I'm trying to view something that's kind of tricky to see, which is just this slight chromatic aberration where it gets a little bit more red uh, as this dome approaches its apex point, its peak point of curving around the form. Peak point being the terminology used by John DeMartin, a wonderful life drawing guy. Not to be confused with John Martin, the guy who painted biblical scenes of apocalypse and destruction. He's really kind of cool. It's funny because I think he had sort of a goal of getting people to realize how serious the apocalypse is. But now I just look at his paintings and they're so metal that I don't think that's what you're supposed to do. Oh no, I painted it to the sky. How will I solve it? Color pick the blue and paint it off. And see so now, now I'm mixing a little more slowly and gently. So I'll set my flow to 10. A lot of the words in Photoshop, by the way, come from 
uh, <coughs> older conventions. So flow and opa uh, flow specifically comes from you know markers and airbrush, where uh, the more you would push down, the more airflow literally comes out of this little tube. I like dodge and burn or something that I thought were the stupidest terms when I was learning Photoshop, and it was because I'd never been in a dark room or done darkroom photography, but in darkroom photography, you expose it to light and it develops under a specific fluid, and you would literally dodge it by having a little popsicle stick and you'd wave it in front of the light source, and the result was that less light would hit the picture and therefore less of the picture would develop there, and therefore it would have this nice blooming light area. That was too far. I'm doing a new plumb line based just on this little pole to tell me that my window needs to be a little further over. Now visually look at this and ask yourself, where does this line up? I think around here is where my plumb line would say some of that shadow color. Let's test if I got that right. Oh, pretty close. Actually, even brighter. Actually, let's go with pure white. Mm -hmm. uh, this is something that's also just a really fantastic exercise for when you don't feel like painting uh, or you don't feel creative. Uh, I think. You know, sometimes it, when it rains, it pours, and you can just like pound out millions of drawings of things that you're really excited about. And sometimes it's not that. And you have no excuse to not paint, even if you don't feel like it. <clears throat> so, what you should be doing, if you don't feel like it, if you can't think of a creative thing to do, do something uncreative, which is a master study. These are actually quite uncreative, right? I mean, you know, there's small creative decisions, but it's somebody else's artwork. We're doing it solely to learn from it. Put some of that red. See this like little reflected light going into that shadow? Make this real dark. Put that red right. So, if you don't feel creative, pick an artist you love and try and get into their headspace of how did they do this masterwork that you, know, you could stare at for 20 minutes straight. It's one of the reasons I like going to museums also.
How is this looking? Pretty close. I've learned a lot. I think uh, some of the things that I really miss is like details here. Let's take a break and then I'll finish it up on a second round. <laughs> 